there was any archetype in fighting games that I would consider to be the most recognizable, I might say it's the grappler. If you see a character with big arms who towers over most, they tend to be grapplers. Though plenty of characters still subvert our expectations on who grapples and who doesn't. They work in different shapes and sizes, so it all comes down to the moveset. Grappling generally involves grabbing, throwing, slamming into the ground, etc. It's a very close and personal play style, so you'll get well acquainted with these folks when fighting them. With this being such a robust archetype, in finding the best grapplers in fighting games, I had an amount of options more massive than these characters' muscles. So because of that, one character per series of origin. Now, let's grab on to the top 10 grapplers in fighting games. Number 10, Sarah Bella from Skullgirls. I discussed her back on my fighting game henchman list, where we learned that she was the muscle of the Medici Mafia, but mostly because she's naive and misled. Her heart isn't evil, so she's not always going to do the morally wrong thing. The main reason she was accepted for this position is because she has the magical hat vice versa, which just forms giant arms that fight alongside Cerebella. While the hat has a mind of its own, it needs Cerebella's movement and direction to be successful, so it's a team effort in how much of a tank Cerebella can be. Cerebella has all the speed and agility that comes with her profession of being a circus performer, so her grabs have this overbearing power combined with her flips and tricks, and she's got a lot of grabs. She'll take you for a spin, or perhaps toss you up and break your back, and if you decide to go airborne against her, willingly or not, she can grab you out of the air and slap you around for a bit, or take you in her hat for a behind the scenes pummeling. There's loads of possibilities. I also like when she whiffs any of her grabs and just looks confused in response. The rest of her powers with her hat go with her tank play style, where she just charges in and either avoids or ignores damage. Her command run doesn't care what you hit her with. She'll take the hit and keep on running, along with doing any of her follow-up attacks. To go with her grabbing motif, my favorite follow-up is when she wraps you in the hat and just does the beating on her own. And if she wants to avoid getting hit using other methods, she's got a rock and anti-air and can do the pew 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 fingers to counter projectiles, making up for her lack of zoning techniques. She has a few other odds and ends that combine her size and speed, but I think I've covered the heavier side of her moveset. Sarah Bella will slam you into next Sunday, all while practicing her circus routine. Here we go! And now for something spectacular! <laughs> no, no, you're too kind! Number 9, Victor from Darkstalkers. Victor is the stand-in for Frankenstein's monster in Darkstalkers. He was genetically created with the finest ingredients, leading him to be pretty buff. Once he had to start fighting, he put those muscles to good use, using his iron grip on anyone that came near him. He may be slow when walking, but he's got some good jumping abilities once he's grabbed you. He'll throw you up high, and to make sure that you reach the ground as fast as possible, he'll jump up to slam you back down. And to make things more fun, he can knee you upwards to go even higher. He'll also take you for a spin on the Victor Go Round if you prefer to go airborne that way. And because he's filled with many volts of electricity, sometimes he'll just use his command grabs to deliver the shock right into your veins. I discussed him on my electric fighting game characters list, where I went over how many other attacks he has that are supercharged with electricity. He's quite a fan of those types of attacks. Since he's naturally a short range fighter, his other physical attacks are heavy charges that are usually electrified to help him get in close by barreling through anything. He can also change his body proportions because video game. And of course, I need to highlight his greatest grab in this video too, the butt grab, where he turns his cheeks into hands and just treats it like a normal electrified grab. Nothing odd here. Despite his aggressive fighting style, his main goal is just to protect his family. His creator had a different creation named Emily, who one day was unable to move. Victor initially thought that he had to collect souls to save her in this case, so he pursued main villain Jetta, who just so happened to be collecting souls for his own purposes. And thus, Victor bashed in the faces of any characters that stood in his way of Jetta. But when that plan fell through, Victor realized that Emily needed electricity similar to what powered himself. 
So with no lightning around, he expelled all of his electricity to save Emily. And with no new Darkstalkers game after that plotline, this is where the story ends. That's sad. He even died with a smile on his face because he was just happy to help Emily. Victor may have been a monster, but he should be remembered as a hero. <laughs> Number 8, Wolf Hawkfield from Virtua Fighter. Wolf Hawkfield is your one-stop shop for grabs. Once he has a hold of you, there's plenty of directions you could go. On the ground, over the shoulder, upside down, but it all ends with you smacking into the floor. He's got an extensive wrestling moveset. I discussed it in my fighting game wrestler video, but my favorite part of his backstory is he was just a woodsman in the forests of Canada, and then a wrestling recruiter found him and was like, hey, you got big arms, you know where those would be useful? Professional wrestling, come on and join us. And then his story was set in stone where he would perform in the ring and enter every Virtua Fighter tournament. Virtua Fighter's story is never really shown in game, so that's the extent of what we see beyond what's written in the instruction manuals. He enjoys his new life, he meets new competitors, and he does all his fancy grabs, that's all you need to know. But it's not all throws for Wolf, he's fast with his hands and head too. Too. Starting up combos, he can do some open-handed strikes or even just a shoulder charge or headbutt. Once he gains some momentum with that, then we can get some grappling fun. He can grab you on the ground, maybe crack a leg or an arm while he's over there, or he can grab you mid-combo and toss you around, maybe even out of the air. With Virtua Fighter having more realistic physics compared to other games on this list, you don't quite go sky high, but Wolf brings you high enough to make the ground hurt. Because he's a tall man, Man, him merely lifting you over his shoulders elevates you higher than a human should normally be. And if he gets a hold of your legs, don't expect to escape willingly. Prepare for takeoff. Back out. To be strong is beautiful. Number 7, Iron Tiger from Blaze Blue. Iron Tiger is another grappler who was on my electricity list. And if I had a nickel for every time that happened, well, you know the meme. Though, instead of just using pure electricity as a way to hurt the opponent directly, he specializes in electromagnetism, where he makes his opponent magnetic on contact, and with the biggest piece of metal on the field being Tiger himself, the only thing that magnetic pull is going towards is Tiger. The magnetic Magnetism makes up for Tager's slower speed, since he doesn't have to lumber over to the opponent if they're far away. He can just tell them to get over here with the magnetism and start the pain, or continue the pain. He can end combos by making his opponent magnetic, so if he punches or throws them away, they just float back over to him and he can continue the pummeling. He was bestowed all these powers by the scientist Kokonoe, who uses Tager to help her fulfill missions that he could potentially power through. He does doesn't particularly agree with her, but he's going against the evil in this universe, so he complies nonetheless. He's straight to the point with his criticism of her though, so she knows his real opinions. His personality matches the grappling part of his fighting style too, as in, he gets right to the point. He grabs, he throws. Any flashiness that comes with his grappling technique is just the natural impact that comes with dropping from the sky thanks to the force of gravity. Don't worry though, because if Tager throws you in the air, he'll usually come with you, either for a backbreaker or the old-fashioned slamming you into the ground face first. And if you don't get thrown to the sky, then prepare to hit the wall, or end of the screen against an invisible wall. But the point is, prepare for impact. And if there's no impact, then he'll hold you up for a second, thinking about how he can show you his strength, or transfer a bit of magnetism to you. But as you can see, he doesn't need the magnetism to help him bring on the pain more, it just makes his job easier. <laughs> Tiger. 
Number 6, Jax from Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat never really had a traditional grappler in the original trilogy. Attacks like command grabs used to just be able to be blocked like normal attacks, compared to other fighting games where command grabs worked like normal grabs and could break through blocking. The 3D era of Mortal Kombat introduced fighting styles that were more grappling focused, but not really with the special attacks that Mortal Kombat was known for, just with melee attacks. In the rebooted timeline, characters like the Shokans, Kodokan, and Geras all fill the more traditional command grab centric grappler archetype, but I want to give this entry to the guy that's been grappling in each generation of Mortal Kombat, Jackson Jax Briggs. Jax has a lot of grabbing based technology in his moveset. You can tell his arms are important because they're metal, either made of metal or just covered in it depending on the version of Jax you're looking at. His grappling style all starts with his most iconic move known as the Gotcha grab, where he grabs you by the neck and just punches you a few times. What makes it so iconic is as soon as he gets a hold of you, he says, Gotcha! Oh! Fun fact, the original Gotcha sound clip was done by Mortal Kombat co-creator Ed Boon. He's done many more voices than just Scorpion's, oh! Get over here! From there, the gotcha grab evolved. He later got an anti-air version of it, where he could grab you while you were jumping and find a new creative way to toss you around. He also got the ability to hold you after the grab and do delayed follow-ups to add to his beatdown tactics. In addition, his regular grab can just slam you around for a bit. As Mortal Kombat got more detailed in terms of moveset, Jax got some grappler-themed upgrades, getting more wrestling-style attacks and being able to pump up his fists to make Make those grabs even spicier. His ground pound also has some grappler elements, being an unblockable attack for grounded opponents that's slow to start up, but a great tool for getting through your opponent's impenetrable wall of blocking. It can also be used as a fun battle trick, like pop him up, maybe do your anti-air grab, perhaps charge on in for some combos, or if they wait to get up, you can reset him and combo some more. And because he's still prepared for a variety of combat scenarios, he can hold his own at a distance. He can fire arm missiles or energy waves. The energy waves are actually more interesting to me since he could do those without the metal arms. If he had the metal arms, sure, I'd credit those for the attack, but without them, does that imply Jax is strong enough on his own where he can break the sound barrier or just reality itself with a single swing of his arm? Is that speed or power? Cause if it's power, I feel like experiencing his arm strength point blank is basically not survivable. <laughs> <laughs> Number 5, Clark from the King of Fighters. Clark should get a Lifetime Achievement Award for his feats in the King of Fighters series, since he manages to make the roster of every game, being a part of the elite military group, the Kari Warriors, which is also the game that he originated in. He's always on a team with his fellow soldier Ralph, and usually Leona is the third teammate. Sometimes it's his commander Hydern, other times it's been Whip, but regardless of the teammate, Clark is here and he's ready to party. With some villain always trying to obtain ultimate power in the series, the Kari warriors are sent out to investigate what's going on. It even gets personal when Clark learns that his teammate Leona has the blood of one of the demon villains Orochi, who's trying to control her with it. And since there's usually a tournament involved with the plot where the main villain is waiting at the end for the winners, they get to enter every time as one big happy family. They even canonically won the 2003 tournament, so I like that among all the contestants that trained for years for this tournament, a few dudes that didn't even care about the trophy at the end accidentally smashed their way to victory. And how exactly does Clark push through the competition? With a combination of wrestling and straight up throwing. In his first King of Fighters appearance, he was just a pallet swap of his teammate Ralph, but soon after, he was differentiated with a new pose and moves. They share a few similar moves, but Ralph is more focused on hard and explosive hits, while Clark is all about the grabs. His main skill is the backbreaker. Once he gets a hold of you, he loves to toss you around and catch you on his back for the pain. And if he throws you on the ground, don't feel safe, since he loves the elbow drop too. Besides his various ways of breaking backs, he also likes to carry his opponent a lot, sometimes in the air and sometimes just to the other side of the screen 
Kane, and he really gives this the pro wrestling treatment. Why does he need to point to where he's bringing them? No one else is watching, and the opponent can't see. They're too busy being incapacitated temporarily over his shoulder. But seriously, that's a pretty hype super move. Clark may be on a mission, but he makes sure to put on a show on his way to completing it. <laughs> Number 4, Potemkin from Guilty Gear. Potemkin is a gentle giant who only fights because it's better than his alternatives. He was born into a military state where everyone is forced to fight for the land of Zep. Potemkin was born with a genetic condition that makes him larger and stronger than the rest of the soldiers, so he was used as the powerhouse of the group. All soldiers were forced to wear shock collars to ensure obedience, so in earlier games, his face was harder to see because of it. However, he eventually learned that he could rip it off without consequence and exchanged it for a cool suit of armor. The main reason he was compliant with fighting for the army early on is because his nation wanted to use the tournament's prize to get new territory, which he thought was a more civil way than just invading, which they were prone to do. So anytime his fighting could prevent a full-scale war, he would step into the ring. And as someone who doesn't particularly like fighting, he makes sure to finish these matches quickly by dealing as much damage in as few hits as possible. He can do the fan favorite lift and jump with his classic Potemkin Bomber, but also, instead of throwing you up and down, he can spike you into the ground and you bounce up. And because he has giant fists, he can just use his massive reach to keep you at a distance, or slam you into the ground without it being a grab. These his hands were made for slapping as well as grabbing, and those things on his wrists aren't just a fancy watch. They can double as firearms, which yes, is a pun. Once he has you within his grasp, he can unload some fire or projectiles directly on you, followed by likely picking you up again. If he's not throwing you for a loop during the fight, then he's not living up to his repertoire. <laughs> Number 3, Astaroth from Soul Calibur. Astaroth is a very interesting grappler. In a weapon-focused fighting game, putting all your reliance on short-range throwing seems like a foolish idea, but Astaroth makes it work. While he has powerful grabs up close that can overpower even the most skilled swordsman, he backs it up with his very long axe. He's a big man, or a golem, so he needs a big axe, which is as tall as his towering stature. I'm not sure if he's using proper combat technique with it, but he's sure good at swinging it. Even though his axe has some good range, Astaroth is expectedly slow with his movements, so you have to swing carefully against most characters. His grappling comes into play with the axe when we see all his follow-ups to launching or smashing the opponent into the ground with it. He's been known to follow up with a little backbreaker now and then, either on the ground or in pile driver form. He also likes to give you a hand to help you stand up if you're on the ground, but wait, it's just so he can throw you some more after he helps you. He can also grab with the axe itself, using it to pull you in so he can deal with you face to face. My favorite regular grab by him is just where he pushes you on the ground and walks over you as if you're a fancy rug. Ooh, the disrespect. Even though Astaroth seems like he's just one of those mindless muscle minions, he manages to make an impact in the series. Ever since his introduction, Soul Calibur would not be the same without him. I'm not sure what it is, but he brings some sort of energy to the table. He's so full of rage. Swerve, scream. And his constant anger makes sense, since he's a golem brought to life by a cult that works for Ares, the god of war. Astaroth was created to retrieve the evil sword Soul Edge for him, because of course Ares would want that. Astaroth gets destroyed time and again, but he can be revived easily, because he's a golem who works for a god. It can't be that hard for Ares. Though, after Astaroth's canonical death in Soul Calibur 4, a nearly identical Astaroth replaced him in Soul Calibur 5, with the storyline that he was now being mass-produced with the soul of the original. So I guess we're one step closer to buying our very own Astaroth at the local Walmart. He even sounds and fights the same way, so that's a good clone. The other major grappler in the series, Rock, was also a cool design, but he never quite took off like Astaroth did. Astaroth was even featured in the party game Pac-Man Fever, where Nam 
Namco let you play as either Pac-Man characters or some of their most famous characters from other series, and the Soul Calibur rep was Astaroth. Wait, really? Not like Nightmare or Mitsurugi or Taki? I didn't realize that Astaroth was considered the face of the franchise like that, but I guess it goes to show the publisher's high opinion of him. Though Tekken got the seldom seen Tiger Jackson as one of their reps, so maybe they were just picking designs that looked cool. Either way, neither defeat nor death can stop this axe-wielding giant from grinding you into the ground. Number 2, King from Tekken. King is a real stand-up kinda guy, well, stand-up and dropkick kinda guy. And technically, I should say guys plural, because there have been two Jaguar Mask fellows that go by the title of King in Tekken. I've discussed them in various other videos, so to summarize, the first King was an orphan who became a famous luchador. He used his fame and wealth to donate to and build orphanages. After the first King was killed by main villain Ogre in the Tekken 3 storyline, an identical King took took his place, who was one of the orphans that benefited from King's charity all grown up, so he was honoring his fallen hero and using his own wealth to donate to the same good causes. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between the two kings because they wear the same mask, fight the same way, and have the same voice lines of Roar. <laughs> Regardless of the king you play, you're getting command grabs on top of command grabs on top of, you guessed it, projectiles. Just kidding, it's command grabs. The man can go on forever with chain grabs. Pick your favorite finishers. Do you like the arm lock, or are you more of a leg person? Perhaps spin the opponent around by the legs, or maybe just pick them up and drop them. No opponent is too heavy for king. With king's popularity in the Tekken series, though, one similar character tends to get overshadowed when it comes to Jaguar-themed wrestlers. The man known as Armor King is a major part of King's lore, and not a mere copy of King. Similar to King, there have been two Armor Kings, and they both have ferocious feline masks, but they only share a few moves with regular King. Armor King is more quick strike oriented. He still has a myriad of throws, but they're usually one and done instead of leading into other complex throw moves like King. Hey, oh. Story-wise, the first Armor King was the rival turned friendly rival of the first king, helping him make a spectacle in the ring so he could continue to support the orphanage. When that king was killed, Armor King became a mentor for the second king, but Armor King soon fell ill and was ultimately killed in a bar fight against Craig Marduk. When the second king caught wind of this, he sought revenge against Marduk, but he soon realized that an eye for an eye was not the way to go and made amends with him, partnering up with him in the ring later on. But from that, a mysterious new Armor King appeared, who claimed to be the brother of the last Armor King. He was angry that King would forgive and team up with his brother's killer, so now we have a new King vs. Armor King rivalry with a bit less friendship. But regardless of which King vs. Armor King rivalry you prefer, the winner is always he who roars the loudest. Hey, oh. For honorable mentions, since a grappler is basically included in every fighting game, I'll list off the top grappler for a bunch of series I didn't talk about. Tina Armstrong from Dead or Alive, it's wrestling and America in every hit. Waldstein from Undernight in Birth, those are some nice claws you got there buddy. Solomon Grundy in Injustice, he's got chain grabs on top of chain grabs on top of, you guessed it, Swamp. <laughs> Kira from Arcana Heart, so she's a swimmer in a genetically modified bag of water that can grow giant arms and legs. Eh, sure. Blue Mary from Fatal Fury, more of a hybrid between grappling and rushdown, but it's Blue Mary, and I'm not gonna waste an opportunity to mention her. Hugo and Alex from Street Fighter, wait, Street Fighter rep's gonna be later on this list, never mind. And Mike Hagar in the Marvel vs. Capcom series. He originated in the beat em up game Final Fight, which was initially going to be a sequel to Street Fighter and then just became its own spin off series in the same universe. Hagar may have not been in many 
many fighting games, but the pile drivers and lariats he did in the Final Fight series inspired Street Fighter's grappling mindset. When he was fleshed out in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Final Fight Revenge, we saw that, yeah, these moves work perfectly in a fighting game. Plus, he has a metal pipe, and that's cool. The only thing really stopping him from being on this list is he was a bit too similar to the number one pick, and even influenced that character's fighting style. But there's no denying that Mike Hagar brings the hype. It's all over! Number one is a no-brainer for how synonymous this character is with grapplers in fighting games, and probably just video games in general. I couldn't even resist putting him on the thumbnail. Number one, Zangief from Street Fighter. Zangief set the bar for grapplers in fighting games with how over the top he could be. He towers over most of the cast, takes chunks off your health bar with only a few hits, finds dozens of ways to throw you into the ground, and he's pretty intimidating without even even seeing his fighting style. Some of his in-game artwork goes crazy with how much force he's exerting. He was a scary looking dude if he wanted to be. He was so scary that some Street Fighter related media erroneously labeled him as a villain. For the most part, Street Fighter movies and TV shows made him a bad guy. While the US Street Fighter movie and cartoon series had him as a henchman for Dictator Bison, even the Street Fighter anime series had him as a lackey. And of course, Wreck-It Ralph had him with that memorable bad guy but not a bad guy monologue. However, we were so far removed from his 90s villain portrayals at that point that this cameo always felt off to me. I feel like Vega or Balrog or even Sagat would have been a better fit here. But regardless, the real in-game Zangief is actually a nice guy who just wants to fight. He's a professional wrestler who fights bears in the wild to train. You don't need me to tell you that's badass. He's mostly just in the tournament because he likes strong opponents, but when we learn that there's some evil villain trying to use this tournament to further their plans, Zangief is happy to play the hero. Some games he's more involved in the plot than others, but his main goal is to slam everyone into the ground and slam you twice as hard if you're evil. It all starts with his signature move, the Spinning Pile Driver, where he leaps into the air with the opponent in hand and spins while he lands. I don't know if the spinning is for damage or just because it looks cool, but it's hard to imagine Zangief doing it any other way. His second biggest attack is probably his spinning lariat, which is good for coverage but also helps him avoid projectiles. For those of you who recognize this lariat from Mayor of Metro City and Final Fight character Mike Hagar, Zangief actually learned this attack by watching Hagar wrestle on TV in Universe. When Hagar saw Zangief mimic his style, Hagar decided to add a spin to his own pile driver in some games, showing that the two have a mutual respect for each other. Another Zangief staple attack is his running grab that you can see coming from a mile away, but somehow you always get hit by it. He does a suplex out of it, so that's neat. He can also put some meter in this attack to let himself take a hit without being knocked over, so it has some uses. Since his projectile dodging moves either require meter or keep him stationary, he needed a way to get through the array of fireballs in this series while still being able to advance on his opponent, so he learned how to harness energy in his hand momentarily for a move called Banishing Flat, where he just crushes the projectile with his bare fist and some green energy. He's sprinkled in plenty of other throws and uses of his iron body over the years, but that's essentially the Zangief starter package. Intensity may vary. So for setting the grappler playstyle on track for the existence of fighting games and helping his opponent reach the sky and the ground in a matter of seconds, Zangief powers his way to the top of this list. <laughs> Now, what did you think? With this being such a popular archetype, I'm sure I missed a few of your favorites, so let me know your top fighting game grapplers in the comments, whether I discussed them or not. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next video.